I'll give you <laughs> hand, <laughs> hand, hand motion. Hand I was motion. like, you now talk. <laughs> you guys heard, heard through the headphones, right? Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. I pretty much, I can pretty much see that, you know, once the, once the uh, commercial comes on, all right. Yeah. And, there a bu- and there's a bumper, there's a bumper back, music. Too, right? Yeah. All right, cool. That yeah. sounds good. So there's going to be okay. bumper music. Yeah. Bumper in, bumper back. Is it all the same or is it all different? Or do you want to start doing different? Start doing different. All right. So they don't have to, like, all be different. But. Yeah. Yeah. You told Tim that, right? You want all different, like. I let it up to him. I don't want to push him too hard because then I'll say, oh, I'm not doing that. You know? I know he has a lot on his plate because he, he runs football games. I mean, not runs them, but right. he sets the commercials, like the clocks for, for here. It's Villanova football, right? Villanova and Notre Dame. So and I know, Notre Dame. Yeah, What's he Notre does, Dame doing on this station? He does a <laughs> lot of stuff. So usually September, I just stay out of this one. Yeah, that's <laughs> kind of what I'm trying to do. I got you. <laughs> All right. Thanks, Brett. Ready, Hope? Ready? 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 Soil. Soil. <laughs> Soil. Soil. <laughs> Keeping that cap yeah. off. Watch yeah. it dump it. That's a group. <laughs> yeah. Whoops. And again, this is like a bug on the wall, so ignore it. Okay. Yeah, I'm gonna. It has it. been recorded, by the way. So I'm only looking at you. No. <laughs> All right. I, that's it. Okay. Okay. Here we go. Wrong. Wrong one. Hi, and welcome to Bloomers in the Garden. I'm Len Schroeder. And I'm Julio Zamora. And on today's show, we're going to discuss soil from the ground up. Then we're going to help you plant the ultimate fall combo pot. In our fourth segment, we're going to talk about fall vegetables. In our final segment, we're going to talk about growing grass and seeding. So stay tuned, and we'll be right back after the short break. Well... Julio, on today's show, you wanted to talk about garden soil. Yes, I did, Len. You know, soil is, people say, well, what is dirt? And I say, dirt is something to be swept <laughs> under the rug. There's no such thing as dirt. That's right. That's right, Len. It's uh, something we always get it in, um, when people come in, oh, dirt, dirt, dirt. But No, gosh, don't say it. Don't uh, say it. <laughs> yeah, well, you know, a good soil or a good loam it's basically made of three elements and and it's sand and it's clay and it's organic matter and what happens is that many people have it out of proportion you know too much too much sand too much clay um you know stones don't really count although working a stony plot of ground is an awful thing but what we're going to talk about first let's talk about garden soil the type of soil that you do and use for your vegetable garden your flower garden something where you would till over the entire area and uh, how do we start with the, with the uh, vegetable garden or gardens well you've got to decide do I have an issue um, is there too much sand hmm. or is there clay and what's the soil like um, we do soil testing of bloomers uh, go to your local garden center ask them if they would give you a good pH test and take a look at your soil uh, I know every garden center that we know in the area, whether it's Pennsylvania, New Jersey, that they'd be glad to have you come in with a little sample. But the one key is take that sample from several different areas. Don't just grab one big clump. Take it from probably three, four, five, depending on how big the area is, put it all together, and have it so that it's like maybe a pint of soil. And, and most of the area around here it, Len, is sandy or clay. That's right. I, I notice in my garden there's a lot of sandy soil. How can we uh, deal with that in, in, in our gardens? The interesting thing is, is that the, the cure is the same thing. It's adding organic matter. You need to add organic matter to improve the soil. Mm-hmm. Now, clay is an issue with drainage. Now, you can't add stone into it like you do in a pot, in the bottom of a pot, to help it drain. But what you need to do is that you add organic matter and make sure that you're adding that at least a foot down 
so that you don't have it retain moisture all the way to like the first inch or two. You can't skimp in a garden. And it's your only time that you really can get a chance to, to improve an entire soil bed. And so we're gonna get out there and start digging down to a foot, correct? <laughs> get a pair of gloves. That's right. Uh, and again, what is organic matter? Mm. Now, we were talking uh, with Roger in our office and brought up the point of soil science. Now, soil scientists out there, a cation exchange between humus and clay, and that's a lot of gibbly goop, which basically means is nutrient value is exchanged between those two elements into a, a, a way the plants can absorb it through the roots. You don't need to know that. But, right. but if you want, put it in your back pocket and someday you could impress some that's, friends. That's part of the science <laughs> of, uh, of gardening, right, Len? Absolutely. <laughs> and one thing about our show, we do not want to skimp with, with the science portion because gardening, landscaping, plants, it, there is scientific information that we want to give our listeners that they understand the work that it takes to bring a plant to market to have a good garden so all right so if you're gonna have an area and again you said sand versus clay and that you can add sand into a soil but honestly if you add organic matter you actually will add a certain amount of aeration into clay but you have to make sure that it's mixed very well so we're we're adding we're making this uh, foundation really strong by adding the, uh, the organic matter, as you're saying. That's right. And uh, one of the products that we carry at Bloomers is bumper crop. That's the best thing. Great, great, really, uh, right for every plant we have yep. in, our, in our nursery. Yep. That is included every time. What what is in bumper crop that makes it so good? Well, you have a blend of lobster shells, manure compost, worm castings, kelp, peat, and aged bark. And wow. That's quite a bit in there. It is. A back. Kitchen sink in that list anywhere? <laughs> Probably. <yeah. laughs> and it's inoculated with endo and ecto mycorrhizal fungi. Can, can you let us know what that, that is all about, Len, the mycorrhizal fungi? That is a $10 word, and it basically means there's a fungus that will grow on the root of a plant and that it's the means the way a plant will uptake nutrients from the soil. So when it transfers from the soil into the plant, that's what does it. That's as simple as I can do it. Yes, it's, it's almost like, wow. like we, why does somebody want to check their soil's pH? They, they want to, they want to either add lime or find out most of the areas that in, that we have uh, are mostly acidic soils. We talked a little bit about that last week and that they're going to need to add lime and then that most gardens you're going to want your pH around neutral which is seven. Now just like the beneficial bacteria, the, the mycorrhiza that we were talking about, it helps the plant to digest the nutrients better. Now when your pH is at a neutral level the plant will absorb those nutrients better. If it's too acidic or too alkaline, those nutrients get locked up and a plant can't absorb it. Have you ever seen yellow azaleas? Uh, very rarely. Very rarely, where they're yellow, oh, I have. And they're in their yard and all of a sudden there's a, you keep throwing fertilizer right. on it and the plant just stays yellow and the <laughs> leaves are yellow and it looks chlorotic and you put more fertilizer and you dump liquid fertilizer and you dump miracle grow this, miracle grow that, and it stays. And a lot of times it's because the pH is off and it's too alkaline that it can't absorb all of those nutrients that you're throwing on it. So it's important to make sure that you check your pH. Yes, and uh, that is really uh, something that we hardly ever look at, the pH levels. And uh, so, it, like you said, man, it's, it's really important for us to know what's going on in our soil. That's right. And if, if you check it from time to time where where it's not something you need to have it checked, you know, every, you know, six months, mm -hmm. every time you, st you start the garden, get it checked. And, you know, I want to say one thing, that bumper crop is the absolute best organic matter that you can put into a, a garden. 
But there are other ways, like say you have a giant garden and you want to do things where on a big scale, you can use mushroom soil, you can use um, peat moss, you can use uh, cow manure and, and barnyard manure, which is basically chicken manure, um, and like rotted leaves, things like that, and your own compost, make your own compost as well. Sure, that's, that's a great way of uh, adding, again, to building up the soil that we need to get, uh, that's get right. into shape. You know, the next thing is a landscape soil, where landscape soil is basically you create an environment for an individual plant. Now, at Bloomers, I, I've been saying this for 30 years now, how do you plant a plant, a shrub or a tree? You dig the hole twice the size of the plant, you add half, half bumper crop and half the soil back into the hole, mix it all around, pack it all around the roots, and then put it back at the level that it was at when it first was growing and you're adding that same uh, material back into the, the soil. And it's your, you know, your one chance. You can't dig up a tree every year. It's not like a garden where you get another shot at it. That's you right. get one chance, don't waste it. That's right, you know, this is one thing that we always uh, let our customers know when they come in and they buy that one shrub or that one plant or whatever they're gonna be at. And we call that the recipe for success. That's, that's right. Been, that's been our uh, motto since uh, how long, Len? <laughs> yeah, <no. laughs> and, uh, it's, I think 30 years now. At least. And we go over these steps. And not only that, when they buy their plants and they're leaving our, our uh, store, they also have it on, on, uh, on their papers as they walk out so yeah. they, they don't forget. You so. know, we, it's like the old American Express commercial, don't leave home without it. That's right. You need to grab bumper crop or any type of other organic soil amendment so that when you plant your trees and shrubs, it's your one chance to go deep. And that when you're planting that hole, make sure that you are putting some bioactivity in the soil zone. It's essential because you only get one shot at it. We're, we believe in it so much that we'll double our warranty to two years when we install because we know that we use it every time we plant. Yeah, so it's, it's a wonderful one. Uh way to start your planting and uh, that's what we uh, that's what we want you to do be successful you know, yep. be joyful when you get home and you say hey you know i did the right thing that's right and be successful and that's what will happen your loss on plant materials will be minimal now we also are going to talk about soil but what about container soils when when you put it into you're planting a pot we're going to talk a little bit about uh mixed combo pots right. and and i have a note here in our in our section where Basically, container soils aren't really soil. It's a soilless potting soil. What does that mean, William? It's not really a. It's not soil like you see out on out in the uh, garden. It's, its structure is totally different. And it uh, what it does it, um, it like it, it's like a house. It, you know, it holds the moisture in. So, and it also allows the oxygen. To, to root the systems. So That's it's, a, it's a lighter type of a soil. Excellent right? point. Because if you were to go and take some topsoil, and please don't use bagged soil, uh, topsoil in uh, your plantings. Uh, when you're any, whenever you're putting anything into a container, you'll also notice that sometimes things, uh, the cheaper mixes ha are like soils. You don't want to do that. Now, soilless mixes contains peat moss, perlite, sometimes composted bark, sometimes bark finds. Some soils like have a nutrient mix. Um, like for instance, miracle Grow has a has an inorganic fertilizer that's in it that it basically will support your plant until it runs out. Um, tell us about Gardener's Gold. Uh, Gardener's Gold, we, uh, we have this in our store, and it's, I always like it because it's, it's organic, and a lot of our uh, customers are looking for that. Right. And here's the key: instead of having a inorganic fertilizer, it contains a list of different types of fertilizer. That as it breaks down, it's always there. Things like uh, there's some a little bit of manure. There's a little bit of shellfish. There, it also retains moisture, and again, micro biology in your soil and and again it improves the plant because it feeds it it feeds it all containers no matter what need to be supplemented with fertilizer on top but again that's another show 
All right, we're winding up for this thing. Remember, don't leave home without it. Soil amendment, bumper crop, or other type of organic matter. We'll be right back after this short break. Len, we're going to talk a little bit about fall combo pots, which is one of my favorites, of course. I have plenty of them in my house. <laughs> I would like to say I have them, but uh, I just haven't gotten around to it yet. But I'm in the beginning, so Wonderful. what should I do first? The first step is to get the pot. And what we're looking here is for size of the pot. Right. And uh, basically, you want to start out with a 12-inch pot. That will be enough for you to start out with and putting a combo pot together. Yeah, and, and anything smaller than that, and you've got to just use like one type of plant, like put a mom, ew, put something else. That's right. <laughs> Try something else in the room. I'm, you can put pansies or you can put, um, just really, it's a monoculture. Um, and a special shout out to you all of you who have uh, places in Old City. You guys do a fantastic job with window job. boxes. Great job inspiring inspiring yes but first thing you do is have to decide on the size of your pot and then decide how big do you want as far as height goes do you want it to get a certain amount of size it just depends on how, you know what you want it to look like yeah and, to, and like window yeah. blocks as we were talking about you, you can't have them too tall in the middle or else they'll get goofy looking and so you have to have a nice a nice balance you know any landscape it's a balance of color texture and form and uh, that form starts with those taller plants now one thing about pots we failed to mention is are you going to have a saucer or are you going to use pot feet and pot feet are those things that will allow it to drain on the ground but lift it up a little bit so that it allows a little bit of air to get underneath it right so it's you know it's not clogged down on the bottom there when you uh when you have your plants and they, when you're watering your plants right getting clogged up right right okay. and then also most important sun or shade yes. now we get less sun this time of the year mm -hmm. but a, most of the plants available will survive it's it's a shorter season but it's something you got to keep an eye on if you're putting it in the shade and that means in the shade of trees or under an awning or, or under a front porch you've got shade and you have to decide what plants will live there Yes, and you know, then um, that's really placement is really important because if the plant is a shade plant and you have it under a sunny area, that could be a problem. So we need to know where that goes and, and, and uh, make sure that we have it right in the right spot. That's right. Now, dare I make soil? I think we beat that subject to death. But a soilless mix with nutrients whether it's from an inorganic source, which again, that's temporary because once those nutrients are gone and that it's just flushed from the soil, you're basically left with peat, mo peat moss and perlite. So you wanna try, my suggestion is to try to get something that has some organic material in there so it has uh, some staying power. But then, all right, Julio, here's a question. I have pots from the spring and they're looking pretty bad they're overgrown and so I'm gonna rip it out but if I have some more soil in those pots can I use all that soil you can probably use it it's not gonna be bad but you know what when my I pull mine out Len, yeah they're all they all come out so I I like to start out fresh right from the get-go so pretty much everything is gonna happen yeah 50% is the rule so don't use any more than 50% old soil um, again, most of that soil is depleted of nutrient value, depends on what soil you use. Listen, 50% of it you can use of old soil. It's best to replace it all. How about drainage in the bottom of a pot? Well, I like to put a little bit of uh, broken uh, terracotta pieces that I had or uh, some, a few of the rocks. You have some broken pots? Yes, I do. <laughs> <laughs> But, uh, you know, the little, little rocks at the bottom kind of open up that area so it won't get clogged with the, the, uh, the potting soil. You know, that's a really good idea. Um, one thing that we do at the store, it's kind of, we kind of cheat a little bit. We'll put styrofoam peanuts in the bottom so that it lightens it up a little bit, especially on some of those big pots. Oh, yes. So that's those right. Amazon boxes, if they've got any styrofoam peanuts in them, <laughs> dump them in the bottom of your pot and then right. fill it with soil. Great idea. And that, again, it's, it doesn't break down mm -hmm. and it doesn't compact. So it, it really is to help. Right. 
Yep. Use a blend. We like that. Yeah, recycle. Yes. <laughs> so, <laughs> all right. I've got my soil. Mm -hmm. I've got my styrofoam peanuts in the bottom. Now, what do I, how much soil do I put in? I always seem to have a mess of soil after I'm done planting. Well, you don't want to fill it up to the top top because then you're going to have a problem, right? Yeah. So we need to lower that maybe, you know, halfway or just depending on how big your, your plant is in yeah. the pot. So we have to be looking at that. Yeah. Well, so about three quarters, from half to three yeah. quarters up the way, and then, then we're ready to go. Yeah. And then you know what the next step is. Yes. Plants. Plant time. All right. All right. <laughs> yeah, Best like part. It. Yes, it is. <laughs> and what are we looking at first? Tallest plants. Yes. Tallest, Tallest plants, plants first. first. And that makes it easy. You can, because now you have that one plant that you can see the color and the texture that we were talking about. Yeah. So it kind of helps you out to do the rest of it. So yeah. that's important. Well, that tall plant's the first one to decide. And then you have to decide, too, am I a traditionalist where I want it in the center and everything else goes around it from, right. the, from the next size down to the final, uh, what we call hangly danglies, or do you want a more of a um, a new Vogue look where it's offset to one side and it's, it looks like uh, my brother's bad haircut. But <laughs> the thing is, is that it does have its place depending on where you're going to place it. So if you're going to put it in front of your front door, that may have a difference. That's right. Now, tall plants. Give me a rundown. What can we use as a tall plant? Well, last week we talked about millet, which is a great choice, I think. Love it. You know, love that one. And uh, daylilies and ornamental grasses are wonderful. There's so many ornamental grasses that can be used that, yes. and the colors. Um, also, rutabecchia, mm -hmm. which is a type of black-eyed Susan, but you have to check if they're hardy. Sometimes yes. they're hardy. And what you do is you'll transplant those into another part of your yard after the first frost mm -hmm. or after they, they begin to peter out a bit. We also have woody shrubs, and we have hydrangea, and that's a, that's a beautiful plant, Len. That is. The hydrangea. There are dwarf them, varieties. Dwarf, that huh? bobo variety we talked about that's is a right. dwarf variety in that's a pot, right. tall. Mm -hmm. That'd be a great choice. Great. Now, you want to have something that's at least 14 inches or bigger as far as a pot size, right. and then you'll be able to plant around it. We also talked about evergreens like boxwood and even roses. Yeah. Um, put a trellis, and, and you'll have um, a rose that can grow, or there's tree form roses that can be used. They're wonderful. Yeah. Now, how about second tier? Something that's going to be the next size down. Second tier would be like uh, kale. Or, I'm sorry. Yeah, the, the that's tradition. Pansies. Yeah. Yeah, they're nice. Uh, and the little peppers, the little red. The ornamental peppers. peppers. Yes, they're wonderful. I love that. Those yeah. colors. And you go back to grasses again. There's dwarf grasses That's and right. there's things that can be used. But also try something different. Try a dwarf conifer. Mm -hmm. You know, there, there's some small varieties of boxwoods and and there's other things like herbs. And then we come to our hangly dangly section. Mm -hmm. And that's creeping jenny and herbs and things that will hang down the side of the pot. Think of a dwarf cotton ester or a zicatoni ester. Now again, Check your fairy garden department in your local garden center. Great ideas oh, for plants there. Remember its placement, color, texture, and form, and make sure you water eliminating any air pockets when you're done. All right, we'll be right back after this message. <laughs> we didn't get through that one. <laughs> okay.
Well, Julio, the frost is on the pumpkin, they say, or it almost is. We're going to be, be uh, hauling pumpkins next week out of Lancaster County, and you know it's coming right behind that. It's cooler weather. So what that means is you've got to start house training your porch and patio plants that you put outside. A lot of people are using palms and dracaena and different types of what are traditional house plants um, as just accent plants, whether it's around the pool. You need to decide first, is it worth it? I think so, Len. It, it, it's just, uh, it, when you're talking about palms and ficus and hip, all these wonderful plants that I've never seen before are being used in, in, uh, in our gardens, it really uh, makes it exciting because not everybody's doing that, but we see it more now and it's really something fresh. Well, like we established last week, I'm the numbers guy. <laughs> is the monetary value of caring and battling for some of these plants worth it? Um, sometimes it's not. And, and I give you all permission to throw them away or to give them away or to do something else just because sometimes if they've been outside full sun all season long and now you're gonna try to bring them into a home that doesn't have a lot of sunlight, you're gonna battle that plant the entire season and when it comes to the time of spring next year that you're going to bring it out, that's going to be around May, it may look pretty sad. You might not make it, huh? It might not. <laughs> but if you're going to bring it in, we've got, a, we've got some advice. Um, it's, a, it's, a, it's going to take probably about three weeks to a month. Our, our frost date is... Uh, for the first frost is usually it's mid-October, depending on some of the the northern um, uh, suburbs, it might be a little earlier than that. But here's here's the first step: uh, you do have to spray it. And what do we recommend spraying it, Julio? Well, we recommend taking Bonide All Season Horticultural Oil, and this oil is 100% organic. It's a mineral oil. Ah, mineral oil. Yes. Okay. And what, how does it work? You have to uh, take it and smother it on, on the plant. Now, um, so you spray it, spray it on the plant? Spray it on the plant. And do you, you have to do, do you do, you, do you do it on just the top and, and it goes, it's, it's not a systemic, which means no. that it's a contact spray. Contact spray, yes, correct. And you have to smother this plant, not only to the top, but underneath. So you can spray it underneath, and it, yes. and it smothers the adults and the egg masses. It doesn't necessarily work as a poison, but it coats them, and it kills them that way. Correct. Now, there are multiple generations, so most insects, it's going to go from an egg stage to a nymph stage to an adult stage, and then it lays eggs, and then it starts all over again. Um, we recommend two applications, seven to ten days apart, and making sure that you get underneath the leaves. It's essential because you need to make sure that you're getting the eggs and you're getting the nymphs and you're getting anything that may blow onto it before you bring it inside. So seven to ten days apart, two applications of Bonide All Season Horticultural Oil, all organic, 100% organic mineral oil. You certainly don't want to be bringing in your houseplant and all of a sudden having a brood of insects you know, growing in your living room. Uh, I've had customers call in a panic, screaming, because they have a bunch of aphids that are now crawling on them as they're walking into their, <laughs> into their dining room. Um, the organic uh, bonite all-season horticultural, that'll stop that. So again, two applications. Yes, and, and to me, you know, that, that the organic is important because it's inside your home, whether you have pets, yep. children, things like this. So. It's a great product to have. Yeah, and now the question is to pot or not to pot? Yes, you know, uh, I, would, I would repot. I always like, once it's outside and you're gonna bring it in, I like to repot my pots and, and um, so they're, fr they're fresh again. You know, they're looking really beautiful. And it'll certainly help that. One thing during the winter months is, again, we have less sun, but the heat's on. So that dries out that plant. And all of a sudden, we've had problems even in our own greenhouses with the humidity levels not being held high enough and it affects those plants. And that's what kills a lot of them. It's not necessarily the lack of sun or anything that you did, 
it's just that that winter dryness so we were talking about uh what bloody noses the other day in the winter um and that it's because the humidity goes so low that you need to make sure that it has some moisture there so like you said repot those plants yeah. you know another great thing about repotting in the fall is pots are on sale oh, most yes, of the time that's right. go to your local garden center tell them you heard it here at bloomers in the garden that's right. that their pots are more than likely on sale um that it also is an opportunity where you're gonna have moisture kind of redecorate your plant and give it a fresh start for the winter one thing i want to add len is that if you don't want to do these pots we will do it for you okay if there's that's true that's most good. garden centers will, will do some repotting yeah, so, so if you're a little hesitant we're there for you yep yeah and and again it's 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 something that is easily done in mm -hmm. in one rule of thumb it's how big do i get my pot that here, here's the two inches or larger between the wall of the pot and the root so if you're you have one of those plants that are in a 10 inch pot you want to go to a minimum of a 12 to 14 inch size pot and replant it because that thing is going to be so root bound remember in the last segment we talked about how you know do you use old soil and you said when you pull your plants out there is no soil because right. it's all root right. that's how these plants are going to be so make sure that you go ahead and repot them make sure that you have a saucer under there because i made a mistake of not having it once <laughs> <laughs> i had water all over my my home so you can have new rugs as well <laughs> <That's> right, right. <laughs> yeah you don't want that <laughs> and again we're going to talk about soil again we're going to use a soilless mix that has added organic nutrients that is the best potting soil for a container okay i'm going to say it one more time soilless potting soil with added organic nutrients is the best so we're also not going to forget our fertilizer that we need to put on there all right slow release because we slow, usually yes. don't want to feed in winter but this is still fall and it's still going to grow a little bit and that you're going to want a slow release fertilizer like an osmocote or better yet a jack's classic uh or that's an or it's an organic see problems with organics is they have a little bit of a smell to them it does yes it yeah does, we don't so. we don't necessarily want to smell in the living room you know you can blame it on the cat but again <laughs> it's uh stick with an inorganic fertilizer and and again if if you are a strict organic gardener there are other choices but just uh give it the sniff test and see if it's gonna smell up your uh, your living room um one other thing we were talking about jacks right oh yes jacks jacks is the best uh, fertilizer out there right now if you if anybody remembers peters um we're going to talk about where jack's fertilizer is from and and how that it's gotten to be one of the best fertilizers on the market that um let's see we're gonna be talking about vegetables our next segment so hang on we'll be right back after this Len, after all that hard work we put in the garden and all that soil we've been talking about running you know putting in all the uh all the bumper crop and all the organic matter uh, we're, we're ready to eat yeah i'm ready <laughs> but we've got to plant our garden that's right you know it's uh it is getting cold but there still is time to put plants in your garden and the one question i have is where does your food come from yes that's a question we hardly ever uh, can answer can we right when you grow your own vegetables you know where it's coming from and also you're reducing your grocery bill yeah, so, and then not only that, you get really, really good fresh food right at the tip of your uh, doorstep. Right, and you know, at the end of the season, American produce supply begins to shift from the U.S. to Mexico, Central America, South America. Um, and my question is, does Chile have the same EPA requirements as the U.S.? Mm -hmm. In 2015, the yes. FDA found that 9.4% of fruit and 9.7% of uh, vegetables violated the U.S. federal standard for pesticide residue. Wow. Wow. Well, well, so the organic folks pay attention. Um, you know, that does sound, it sounds high, but the benefits to eating fruits and vegetables far outweigh the risk of pesticide residue. 
Um, the one thing too is if you're growing in your own garden, you know where it comes from. But keep in mind, our imported fruit comes 46% from Mexico, 15% from Chile, 9% from Guatemala, 8% from Costa Rica, 6% from Peru. I was surprised only 3% from Canada, 3% from Honduras, and 8% spread out among the rest of the world. Now that's imported fruit. Um, so get out there and plant some. Yeah, it's it's time to garden again and coal crops and there are some other things that you can still still do. Now, what's the first thing you have to do when going in your garden? We need to know what the first frost date is. And what is it? In South Jersey, Reading, and Mainline, it's October 19th. And uh, so we need to know what time frame we have. So what about the other towns in there? Like Allentown, oh, Allentown is earlier, right? Yes, Allentown is a little earlier. Yes, it's October 10th. And Delaware is November 1st. Wow. Philadelphia Franklin Institute area is November 10th. I saw that. Wow. November 10th. Now, That's pretty. Heat of the buildings, yeah, the things yeah. in Philadelphia, it keeps things warmer. So November 10th. So everybody complaining it's cold before November 10th. <laughs> it's not true. <laughs> <That's right. laughs> now, if production is stopped, on your, on say tomatoes or eggplant or especially some of the, the vining crops like um, cucumbers, they're pretty much winding down. Just pull them out and make room and make sure that you get rid of all of those leaves by either putting them in the trash or composting them. Any of the leftover vegetables that, that you have, you don't want to leave any of those leaves in the garden. You don't want to necessarily till them in. You can till the roots in, but there are spores, there's insects, there's diseases that can overwinter and be that same problem that you had this year. You know, everybody wonders, it's like, okay, well, where does cucumber beetle come from? And it's, it comes from an egg mass that overwinters in your garden because you just turned it over. Tough. That's a tough thing to do. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So, so what can we plant now, then? And All right. Well, you know, we, we need to get going here, right? Based on what we talked about, when is your frost date? Now, you'll see a lot of things that will say, "Oh, well, it's, it'll be in 65 days. It'll be in two months, three months." But go out and buy seedlings. Make sure that you're buying seedlings just simply because you get a jump that could be as much as a month over putting seeds in. Now, if you want to, you can start seeds, but remember there's a risk of not making it in time. Some of the leafy vegetables you should be able to harvest, but again, I suggest going with seedlings. Um, like for instance, in a month, you're gonna have leaf lettuce, spinach, but spinach will also go below freezing. And, and that first frost that we talked about, where if we're talking about October 19th, it's there's a frost and then there's a killing frost. That first frost generally kills some of those soft plants, like your impatience will be wiped out, think of maybe hurt. Um, but things like spinach are still there. You can, you can harvest spinach as it grows as well. Same thing with Swiss chard. Um, beets, if you're eating the beet leaves in salad, Keep in mind not to harvest too much as they're growing the actual beet because if you go and you harvest too many, you're going to end up dropping the photosynthesis that takes plant that takes place on the plant and it's going to hurt it. Um, but beets can certainly take cold weather. Radishes, radishes are one of the fastest to mature and they can certainly handle a light a light frost as well. Well, what's next? Well, six to eight weeks, you can. Uh have parsley and harvest as it grows, but not too much, not too much. It keeps the uh, photosynthesis going there. Oh, so you can, you can harvest it as it's growing, mm -hmm. but same thing like the beets, not too, not too fast. That's right, that's right. Kale, though, those people who love that kale out there. I had kale last night oh, for dinner. Ooh, wonderful. Yep. Extremely hardy to take the frost, it even gets better when the cold weather comes, that's wonderful. That's true. Back in the days on the farm, I can remember that it was always discussed on how that the coal crops in the fall tasted better than they did when they were in, planted in the, in the early spring. Wow, that's, that's good to know. Collards, another one, like kale, very hardy. 
very hardy again. You have now you have the broccoli. It takes a little longer because you can't harvest it, you know, along the way. But right. it takes frost and warm free to thirty degrees. Okay, all right, because you got to wait for that head to mature. But I guess is that where broccoli rob comes from? Eh, not really. But <laughs> anyway, that uh, I, the one thing that I like is cauliflower. It's yeah, about the same cool rules like broccoli, but if you've ever grown cauliflower and had it burn, that's been that's a problem because the in the spring if it gets too hot the top will burn and it'll look all funny and it doesn't look very appetizing and that in the in the fall you don't necessarily have that problem because the angle of the sun is a little bit different that was harsh brussels sprouts you love brussels I, sprouts i actually do but i have to add a lot of bacon with them to really love them so it's a little different oh we like that I mean, yeah little bacon is great yeah. And that can grow the longest of, of all the uh, veggies that you might have at harvest all the way up to Christmas, huh? <laughs> <laughs> That's not a bad idea. Yeah, it's maybe, a we'll, maybe we'll plant them. I don't know. Yeah. I, we'll see if I got any time. Now, <laughs> you know, we talked when we were talking about our segment, when we started, we were talking about a cover crop. Right. And that um, you had found that we had in our seed packets a seed packet of yeah, cover crops. A, yeah, that was amazing that, you know, we had one in there. I never knew that. And because uh, you know we were talking about clover before, and then, yep. and then uh, I ran into that uh, uh, mix, uh, packet mix. And I thought, wow, look at this! I didn't know we had had that. You know, and the best thing about like we talked about clover, mm -hmm. and it's other legumes that will grow. That legumes will have nitrogen fixed bacteria, but they'll, they'll actually act, add back, nitrogen back to the soil. So the actually, it's a circular plant, you know, the circle of life, Lion right. King, you know, it goes and it adds nutrients back into the soil. And it's one of the only plants that do that. So it's one thing, consider using a cover crop mm -hmm. and that turning it over a month or so before you plant in the spring right. and you'll have organic nice. matter, depending on what, which variety of plant you use, you'll also add some nitrogen back into the soil. Oh, beautiful. Well. Stay tuned. Yep. We'll be back to talk about grass seed and how to get it to germinate. It's not a struggle. <laughs> well, Julio, uh, how, how did your lawn work? Oh, wait a minute, you don't even have a lawn. Oh, I don't even talk about lawn, man. I mean, in my house, oh my goodness, zoysia. Zoysia, zoysia. Oh, uh, you know, you know about that. a dirty word. Oh, my goodness. You know, zoysia... <laughs> I don't know. I just am not a fan of zoysia. It, it it's I, I, I want to avoid talking about it. You can get it in plugs, but what happens is it in, it's an invasive grass. You know, it oh. does, if you don't like your neighbors, plant some zoysia. Maybe <laughs> I, I I don't know. But in Hula, you've been dealing with zoysia, and it seems like your town there must have been a zoysia salesman that came through and went to every house, knocked on their door, and said, "Hey, you want some zoysia <laughs> plugs? Right. I got it, real cheap." That's right. I think it goes right over the you know the uh, concrete too. <laughs> it's amazing. <laughs> Every everybody in my my neighborhood has it. It's, it's you have it grown in your beds too, right? Oh, they come in my, my they come in. They just keep taking over. I, I hate it. Well, oh. that's about all we're going to say about soja. That's For right. those fans, you. you can send your mail to Julio Zamora at oh, Bloomers yeah. .com. Uh, <laughs> All right, let's again. Soja is a warm season grass. Doesn't belong in this area. All right, let's talk about cool season grasses. Yes, and good. talk about grass. What type of grass seed do we have that we that are best used for this area? Well, we have Bloomer's blend. It's a wonderful blend. Yep, it is. And what's in it? It's in our. It's in. Uh, it's got bluegrass. It has fescue grass. And uh, you want to talk a little bit more about those? Later? Yeah, and it's also got a little bit of ryegrass. But what we have in this area is fescue has taken over as far as the the shelves of, of most of the grass seed and but bluegrass is making comeback fescue is a clumping grass and it, and it is a fine blade it tolerates drought real well uh, bluegrass is also a fine blade but it sends tillers and it holds the ground better like for instance you can in, in ryegrass is similar to to um fescue where it's a clumping grass and it's and it's it comes and germinates really fast like if you put that uh, ryegrass in, it can germinate in a week. Um, but let's talk about bluegrass. Bluegrass will hold the ground because it sends tillers down and then back up so that you're not going to be able to 
kick a divot out of it mm. the way that you would some of the other grasses. So that's, you know, that's one thing. And, and then you won't have uh, bald spots like the top of my head. <laughs> so. so this is really important. Bluegrass is important mix. Uh, I, I think it is. We put it in our mix that it actually mirrors so our sod mix. Uh, so it looks like sod. Even fescue sod contains bluegrass because if you tried to roll it up, it would kind of fall apart. So, but let's talk. When is it time to seed your lawn? This is a good time right now. It is? Yes. You know, we're getting into the cooler weathers and, uh, you know, you have, you have bald spots besides one, you know. Yeah. And um, so how do you know if, if, like, when is it time to just seed the bare spots or is it time to completely destroy everything? Well, it's 50% of more weeds in, in, in your uh, lawn and it's time to complete the renovation. So nuclear option 50 percent or more weeds or bare spots yes you, know, you need to really look at that in that sense you know you're going to have to when it's half of it is, is pretty much bad like that then you need to look at it and say oh it's a uh, losing proposition yes. again mm -hmm. talking about the expense that you would have in time and money trying to renovate weeds 50 percent or more it's time to just spray a, say a, a, a roundup type roundup. problem mm -hmm. Yeah, a product. Um, I I prefer um, some of the other ones that are out there. Uh, that I know that Bonide has a real good one called Cleanup, and it, yes. where you can reseed in seven. I think it's seven to fourteen days, something like that. It's pretty fast. Yep. Mm -hmm. Yep. Now we're not going to get into varieties of seeds so much as we are going to try to just talk about basic seed germinating uh, requirements. The one rule that you have to follow is you have to get the seed in contact with the soil. If it's not in contact with the soil, it's not going to grow. Now, the way that a seed germinates is that there's a seed coat that's on the seed and that has to break down and then it sends out a little root hair and then you want it to make sure that that little root hair goes into the soil. If it's just sitting on the top of thatch or it's sitting in the top of, of uh, something that is not going to touch the soil where it's on, actually still in the lawn, that it's dead. It's going to sprout that root hair and it's going to try to grasp on, the air is going to dry it out, and you're going to have no success. So anybody out there that's, that's had no success with seed, I would bet that you're not getting good seed soil penetration. So, so how do you get this uh, penetration? And, and so they have to do some prep work, right? Yeah, yeah. We talked about bare spots where you got to rough up the bare spots, and you need to to get it in those areas. And you also need to apply a cover. Um, we're back to bumper crop again. Don't leave them without it. Uh, using bumper crop or a, a type of compost to cover it. If you're doing too large of, of an area, there are different types of Actually, it's a recycled product that are little pellets that are made out of newspaper. And it's interesting, you look at the pellets, and there are some times where you can actually see the typeface in the news, from the newspaper in the pellets. And what happens, you put your seed down, you rough up the soil, and you want to do it to about one inch, two inches is better. Lay the seed down, apply the product, and it's most of the coats, it's like a seed mulch. You'll, you'll see them on the shelf at your local garden center. And that you put that down and it will cover the seed. Um, you're gonna wanna step it down a little bit. So again, soil, seed, contact, okay? And then water it in and that, that works really well. And it's mostly on bigger, on bigger areas. Um, one thing that a mechanical way to get seed soil contact is by using a power seeder. A power seeder is a machine that has like it's a row of skill saw blades on the bottom that go through your lawn and they go into the soil and about an inch or two down and they create these little grooves where the seeds are dropped right behind it and they go into these little grooves and then as soon as that's watered it covers the seeds up and then they start to germinate 
if you're if you're overseeding, that's the best way to do it. That's the best way. That sounds like it's really not 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 uh, hard to do. It's, well, it, it, the it equipment's kind of big, oh, okay. and and you can put it in like an SUV without okay. too much of a problem. Mm -hmm. It costs about. I don't know. You could probably rent one for about a hundred bucks. Oh, that's not bad. No, especially because you'll have a brand new lawn. That's right. Yeah, yeah. yeah. and it's look great. and one thing the two if you're if you're going to recede an entire area, then absolutely go and uh, and use it because, you know, say you have a thousand square foot or two thousand square foot, go ahead and do it. Oh yeah. You know, you you'll get the penetration in the soil. Now, core aerator, Julio, are you familiar with a, what a core aerator is? No, like, could you go over that with it with us? Or, uh, that's an interesting core thing. aerator uh, takes a plug out of the ground, okay. and what it'll do is that little plug will come out and it makes elbow room for the other grass to grow. Now you can also go and use a thatcher, oh, and you can reseed, but you're overseeding. You want to water it in and make sure that things are are going to get in contact with the soil. Again, core aerator and thatcher, that's not necessarily meant to seed, but it will help your grass to grow thicker for sure. Power seeder is the best way to go. Oh, that's wonderful. Yep. Thank you, thank you, thank you. <laughs> <laughs> All right. <laughs> we'll be right back after these messages. We'll leave you start. Well, Len, we covered a lot of ground, or should I say soil? That's <laughs> uh, funny. <laughs> I get it. Yeah. Soil, ground. Yeah, right. <laughs> so we want to thank you for joining us today. Make sure you join us next week when we're going to talk about fall lawn care. That's right. And we're also going to have on Shirley Spurbeck, our wild bird yeah, specialist at Bloomers. Yeah that uh, Shirley's got an advantage that we don't have. That's she, right. she's, <laughs> Shirley is from New Zealand, has an accent oh, that you just have to believe what she says because it automatically, she has instant yeah. credibility. We love it. You know, we're also going to talk about uh, succulents. Mm -hmm. Succulents are the most popular house plant right now and that they are probably on everybody's dining room table or at least in their kitchen somewhere. Right. And we're going to take some of the mystery out of, uh, right. out of succulents. Now, Julio, what was your favorite segment today? I just love the pots. You know, me landing pots. I'm a yeah. pot man. Yeah, pot man. <laughs> I've got about six or eight in my, my front lawn. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Listen, if you have any questions about what we spoke about today or would like to ask us questions, please see us at www.bloomersinthegarden.com. And we'll answer your questions, and we'll answer your questions on the air, too. I want to thank you for being with us at Bloomers in the Garden. And we'll see you in the garden. Yes, meet us here next week, and we'll see you in the garden. <laughs> so we ended a minute.